Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special interview on the NFT Show YouTube channel with none other than international man of mystery, James Altucher. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on here. And one day, maybe I will be an international man of mystery. We're working on it. So James is fresh off of very impressive chess victories against me and a bunch of other bozos. I'm sure he's riding high right now. But we're at live at Web3 Expo, and we're really excited to be able to chat with James. James, for people that may not know, could you give a little background on, on who you are and you know some of the things that you've gotten into? Yeah, maybe we could start with you going up to hookers in the street, I think was one of the... Was, my, one of my favorite jobs ever actually yeah. <laughs> and yeah well, this was in the 90s and i was trying to convince hbo hey just like you guys started the whole era of original programming on tv there's this new medium and and at first they said when i said this they're like what new medium and i said there's this internet web thing and they're like james 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 why don't you let the cable guys do what they're good at and you just do what you're good stay in your cubicle you do what you're good at but I convinced them to do HBO style programming on the web. So I did a, a web show. Maybe you could even call it the first podcast where it was called 3 a.m. And it's about what people are up to in New York City on a Tuesday night at three in the morning. Because if you're out at three in the morning on a Tuesday night, you're up. You're not up to something good. Like you're up to something bad. <laughs> if you're not a stand up comic, what are you doing? Right, right. <laughs> Particularly three in the morning. Even the comedy clubs are closed. And Saturday night, anybody could be out. It could be party night or whatever. But Tuesday night, if there's like a man and a woman arguing in the street at, at three in the morning on a Tuesday night, something's going down. Like, yeah. why aren't they getting ready for work the next day? Or why aren't they, you know, even if you're a student, okay, why aren't you studying? Or if you have a job, you're going to go to work the next day. So always, and it was true. Oh, I did this for two and a half years for HBO. I interviewed every single Tuesday, didn't miss a Tuesday. I probably interviewed 20 people a week. And then we would take the four best, transcribe it, do web design around it occasionally video, which was very hard back then, and put it on the web, put it on HBO.com. You've been creating content for a long time, right? Like you had, I think you had a hedge fund for one period of yeah, time. Yeah, a very then, entertaining thing to, to do. <laughs> so that's also content. And, but but was that prior, like were you doing, you were in finance before diving down the content space or have you no, always no. been creating? I was, I was, um, a technology, I was a computer science guy. I was okay. a software guy. I, and I figured my, but I always, wanted to do content like that was my dream mm -hmm. and so i figured the back door into content was to work at hbo as a programmer i loved hbo so i had two offers i was it was 1994 i had two job job offers one was a massive eighty thousand a year from jp morgan to be a programmer and eighty thousand in new york city still doesn't get you anything <laughs> but it, that also hbo offered me forty thousand a year so exactly half i took the hbo offer because i loved hbo and i want again i wanted to get in the back door and I figured, okay, maybe this will give me some opportunity to pitch a TV show to them eventually. And then the web was, I convinced them to do a website. And then that's when I, I went up to the CEO, Jeff Bukas, who funny enough, I ran into a few months ago. And I said to him, what about HBO doing this kind of original program? He's like, ah, whatever you do it. And uh, so then I went back to my boss and I said, the CEO, Jeff said, I should do this. And he's like, well, or why did you go above me? And I don't know. Just, I ran into him all. <laughs> and then, and then, so suddenly I was doing it, and I had this weird job. I was in the IT department, but I had this weird job of like going out at three in the morning and interviewing hookers and and pimps, and it was insane. Actually, like it was the funnest time of my life. I I miss that time. Did you ever feel like you were in a genuinely risky situation? Oh yeah, <laughs> all the time. One time, so HBO initially had a security guard go with us. So it was me video guy, uh, uh, someone to get release form signed, and maybe another person. And then there was a security guard. And one time we were in this place, it was uh, called Cafe Edelweiss, where uh, there was all these like transvestite prostitutes. I don't know what the correct term for these is now. It's like, <laughs> your neighbor is the correct term right now. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we were asking people like, why are you here? Like the kind of you know, normal looking people, I shouldn't say normal looking people, but the regular looking people. And they were like, look, I'm going home with my wife and kids, but every now and then I want this. And so we were, and then suddenly the bodyguards or the, the security of the, the Cafe Edelweiss were like, hey, this is no good. These guys are up to something. And they, they literally started like physically pushing us around. The security guard that HBO had hired was Zoom. He was like, we all started running. He was five blocks ahead of us. So I said to HBO, no more security guards. We just don't need it. I'm going to be more nimble without it. But almost every episode, almost every time we were out there, there was some trouble. 
nobody wants to talk to you at three in the morning. You go up to a couple arguing or you go up to like a pimp or you go up to, you know, a drug dealer. They don't really want to talk to you. So and you, and you were on the on screen talent during that, right? Like you were trying, yeah. like microphone. To, yeah. To, OK. It, it, when you when did you transition to like writing as your primary medium? Because you've written like, what, 25 books or something yeah. like that now, yeah, which so, is an absurd amount. So so when I started doing this for HBO, other comp I didn't know anything at all about business. I wasn't interested in business. And other companies started calling and saying, hey, can you do for us what you did for HBO? And there was like at that time, this is 1995, 1996. There were like five people in New York City who knew how to do websites. And I was one of them. And so I called up my brother-in-law and because uh, I was still an employee at HBO. And I said, let's just use you to pitch these other people. And we started a business. So we did AmericanExpress.com. We did TimeWarner.com. We did so many movie studios. We did every gangster rap record label because of, you know, and, <laughs> and, and natural was, fit. Yeah, yeah, it was course. So, and we was did no limit rag. soldiers. One of them. Hmm? Yeah, how about no limit soldiers? Oh, yeah, we did that? no limit. Oh, there so, we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we did. We did uh, uh, loud records, bad boy. Uh, and it was such wow. you, you got to see like the inner workings of that industry. And it was just a total weird industry. But we, we, we did this company. We, we built it up. At one point, my younger sister calls me and says, oh, we're learning how to make websites in junior high school. And I said, OK, we got to sell the business immediately. We sold it because <laughs> it became like just an in-house thing for every company. And we were we were charging like ridiculous money for three page websites like, oh, it's code. You have to know HTML programming yeah. if you're going to do this. <laughs> and so so but I did make a lot of mistakes. I didn't know anything about business. I I was writing. This is a big critical mistake, which I always regret. I was writing software to make it as easy as possible for me to do, let's say AmericanExpress.com was a 100,000 page website. And so I made like all this software to make websites really easy. And only later did I realize like I had basically written software that could have been like a WordPress, but I didn't want to tell anybody because then they wouldn't pay us what we were charging because it was like seemed very expensive to them to do a 100,000 page website. So I, I didn't understand the difference between product and service. Yeah. That, that companies value the scalability. I didn't understand scalability. Like I thought, oh, but don't don't isn't it cool that we make a profit? No, 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 no. Product. And we don't have a product. We're making a lot of money. And oh, okay, you value it for six times earnings instead of like a billion times nothing. You were literally like, I'm had this conversation last night with somebody who was like, guys, you can't just do media. You need to have a product. And we were like, but media is like, you got to like grow the audience. Like that's the biggest leverage nowadays. It's yeah. the hardest thing to grow. Well, you're right. They're, they're a little bit wrong there because media is scalable. Well, yeah. he said, no, don't stop any of the stuff you're doing with media, but don't tell people about it because you'll be able to raise more money if they think you're just making a product. That, that could be actually. So if you're making a product like, oh, we've got the infrastructure to yeah. blah, blah, blah. We're going to do web three, you know, web three. TikTok video, <laughs> like identity on the blockchain, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's always good if you if you have an audience and you and, and the audience is scalable, you make money. And yeah, but if you have a service business, you make profits. And so if you're just getting started, making profits is important. And and then you kind of you know switch like a classic example, Oracle. They were always a database company. But the very first databases they sold, let's say they sold a database to General Motors. They're like, okay, General Motors, we're going to deliver our product to you, but we need to put 130 software engineers on location for about six months just to make sure you transition to the product. They were building the product. like They were just providing a service, but they always called themselves a product company. And eventually, they had enough clients. They became a product company. Yep. So they, they faked it until they made it. Good for Larry Ellison. He's worth whatever. A uh, couple, couple of bucks. <laughs> he did all right. He you did. You never right. even hear about him anymore. Like when you think of like billionaire, he's probably like he, the second richest guy on the planet. And he, he showed up in the Elon Musk text text messages, yes. which were one of the most fascinating like threads to read. I'm just yeah. like, this is incredible. Like that was like some of the best content that I'd seen in a while. He was like, "Yo, I'm writing you down on this uh, cap table or whatever for this round," and and he was like. I, uh, how much can you put in? And he was like, I don't know, a billy. And I was like, Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And, 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 and Elon, Elon was like something like, How about two? And Larry, no problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah, where do I wire? Yeah, he was like, And let me know if you need anything because else. You figure we only know what their wealth is from like, Oh, how many shares of Oracle did he have? And then how much did he make when he sold them? Yeah. But then you don't know, like, he also probably was in Uber and Airbnb and 
you know, all the China companies. Crazy and, deal flow, right? Yeah, Coming he, his yeah, way. Yeah, he got into the whole Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia benchmark deal flow. So he's he's probably made guys like that who were billionaires in that first wave of tech billionaires probably made so much money in addition to his Oracle shares. Yeah. Which, by the way, why is Oracle worth anything anymore? <laughs> it's, it's like an SAP competitor, I guess. Or, well, why did both of those companies for, for exist? Dino basically? dinosaur businesses uh, that won't adapt? They need someone. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I thought like at, at first, didn't they buy? They bought SQL, you know, SQL, which is like for big for Web two companies. Yeah. But I don't. Know, then they bought yeah because Sun Microsystems owned SQL. They bought Sun. And they own Java. Yeah, Java, but yeah. nobody. I mean, again, why do they exist? Though I have no idea. <laughs> It's not clear to me, but uh, companies do like overcomplicating things. And the more that you have departments inside of organizations, the more complexity that needs to exist in order to like sort of value or validate like your role within the organization. And you're like, look at the solution that we created. And we leveraged that using this enterprise software, which means that it's both scalable and secure. And the, and the boss is that. like, wow, that's phenomenal. <laughs> that, that excellent. Okay, excellent let job. me ask you guys a question. Do you know even one employee at Oracle? No, no. No, where are they? Actually, <laughs> I think I met, I know a salesperson. There's salespeople and I was like, damn, you guys, th there's some salespeople where I'm like, what, like they're closing these huge deals. The sales cycle for them has to be like multi-year because it has to be, I, I'm assuming a business like that has to do multi-million dollar like contracts. So they have to go through some whole process. You, you, the, as you were speaking about it, it made me click. It was like, oh, so it's basically like data storage is the biggest thing because after you've now invested in building those things, now the sales guy is just like, yeah, we have a new uh, data storage thing, which is way more scalable. It's going to reduce your marginal costs, but data is still going on. So we're still going to make more money uh, and you're going to need to transition to it. So our consulting team over there is going to help you that, make this transition that's seamless. That's true. There's a moat. Like if, yeah. you, if, you, if you hired Oracle or if you bought Oracle in like 1995, yeah. you can't leave. You're like, please, is there some way I can get out of this? And you're talking to everyone else and they're like, no, sorry. We don't even want to touch that job. Yeah, exactly. But we're not going to your attic and cleaning it up. Yeah. So. And that's the easiest sales job in the world because the relationship is there you're just calling yeah. saying i'm the new guy at oracle you know it's like forget about pitching cold calling just i'm the new guy and here's our new thing and you probably have to buy it and yeah, i'm gonna and, get a commission and by the way you're gonna get fired if you don't buy it so, <laughs> where are you gonna go we're gonna just pull the plug on all your other stuff I'm, I'm wondering from your like transition so i i was made familiar with you through randomly through Mike Lazaro when he was starting Buddy Media mentioned Mike, you and I think yeah. did you invest in him at that yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, I invested so, in Buddy Media. So so he met 2007. So here's what happened with Michael Lazaro. So I um I had been doing some day trading. I was running a hedge fund. I was writing a lot about finance, which was not really my interest, but so I started at the Wall Street Journal, right? Uh a Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, a bunch of places. Yeah. And I wanted to start the MySpace for finance because MySpace was like, I had just bought, been bought for 500 million. This was like in 2005 or 2006. And so I I was meeting the CEO of the street.com and two weeks later, and I, I called up a bunch of Indian developers and I said, here's my outline for what I, the site I want to create. Make some screenshots as if the site is done. And so they did. And so Tom, the CEO of the street.com said to me, um, so what are you working on? And well, I made this social media site for investors and I was like, no kidding. Like, uh, can we help out? And I, well, I'm done. Like, here's the screenshots. Like it's all done. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't mean, um, of course it sounds like I'm lying to him. I was, but <laughs> I was making it. So I was already putting money out and making it. And, and, you know, I was taking risk and personal risk cause I was paying out for it out of my own pocket. And, and he's like, well, we'll, how can we get involved? And I said, well, how about you mention stock picker on every single page of the street.com and Jim Cramer writes about it. And, and you let me write three articles a day about it. And he said, done deal. And, and he said, well, how much equity? And I said, I was thinking I'd give you 3% of the equity. And he was like, he said, I was thinking 50%. And I said, deal. <laughs> because, because sometimes you want to give equity so that they're, they're had they invested yeah, yeah they're like i had nothing so of course 50 percent of this go for it and then the day we announced and we got millions of users the first month and jim kramer was mentioning on his great show mad money i really respect and and jim is a great media guy and a great investor and uh uh so we were getting millions of views and we announced our launch with the street and so i immediately called up aol yahoo google Forbes, Reuters, Interactive Corp. And I said, my half is for sale.
So, and, and, and then they were all interested. Like I remember, <laughs> I remember visiting Google and did I, you ever create anything? Hmm? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, we made a site. We had, we had oh, millions okay. of users. Yeah. It was, okay, okay. it was really, it was called stockfaker.com. It was really a great site. Yeah. We had uh, a Q and a section. We had message boards. People would upload their portfolios. You would see if, Oh, how your portfolio interacts with Warren Buffett's portfolio. Was this a precursor. Was this before stock twits existed? It was right before it was stock twits, actually. Okay. So I knew Howard Lindsay very well. Yeah, yeah. He would make fun of, we met because he, the day we launched, he called it nose picker. And I'm like, Howard, you know, I want you involved in this. And so we became good friends. And okay. I, was, I was an investor in stock twits, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> you know, stock twits is a good product, but it's just they never exited. But uh, so, so I remember, though, visiting Google and making the pitch to them because they had started Google Finance and this was perfect for them. And I just loved have you ever visited Google headquarters? Yeah. Like, oh my God, I like <laughs> fell in love with like I remember waking up at three in the morning that night and it's like you're thinking about a date that the first date you just went on. And yeah. like, but like in a bad way. Like I wrote to them <laughs> at three in the morning, like, I can't wait till we meet again. And they never wrote to me again. <laughs> so, but I to the street.com said you can't sell your half to somebody else, like to AOL, because you're with us. And so they bought my half like four months after we launched. Okay. So it was a good, it was a good deal for me. And then, but before that happened though, Michael Lazarow, who I had never met, he had just sold golf.com to Time Warner, to AOL, yeah. to Time Warner, and his shares were vesting. So he was like, I'm looking for something to do. Can I be, I have ideas for you for, to be, you know, I want to be CEO of Stock Picker, the, the site that you created. And I'm like, that's great. I'm not really a good CEO. I'm not a natural for it. What are your ideas? And he started telling me these ideas. I'm writing them all down. I executed on all of them. What he wasn't, the, I never made him the CEO. And, <laughs> Which again, but we became good friends. Like he he got it. And then uh, when he started Buddy Media, which was like a Facebook version yeah. of what I was doing for websites in the 90s, he started doing, and he was smart. He turned it from a service business to a product business. Very smart. I mean, Mike Lazaro is like the best CEO out there for these types of things. And so happy I invested. Uh, Peter Thiel had invested in it. And look, uh, this was right before the financial crisis. So this is the benefit of investing in private companies. You could ignore, like he didn't have a stock or anything. And he was very smart about raising money and keeping going. And then he sold to salesforce.com for like 700 million in 2012. So, yeah. So when, when I saw that, or when I came across you, I was following, I think I subscribed to your blog at that time, then, then newsletter. And then now you have a podcast, but there was at some point there was a transition and I don't know when it was, but I was seeing all of your ads for like cryptocurrency courses and like yeah. things like that. It, your face was literally everywhere that I went on the internet. Unfortunately. And I was like, what the hell is God? I'm like, the, what, what can you tell us a little bit about like what that was? And was that your like entry or your first foray into crypto was via these courses or like, no, what, what was that? I mean, so I had started, so around 2010, uh, I just got sick of everything. Like Wall Street was just such a scam. I just hated that the hedge fund business. I shut that down. I just got sick of everything. So I moved out of the city about 80 miles north, just reduced my, I decided I'm just going to write. And this was before Buddy Media exited, before I had any real exit other than like Stock Picker and my first company, both of which I went broke afterwards. And so I just started writing and I was so sick of everything. I just started writing not about stocks, but just about what it's like to be broke and depressed and come back from that. And like the things I did to come back from that and the things I really cared about and felt about. And everybody was like, I can't believe you're saying all this stuff. This is like too much information. And then <laughs> privately they would write to me and say, I'm a crackhead, you know, so <laughs> don't tell anyone, but Hey, keep up the writing. And, uh, so I was getting really a lot of in private encouragement from people, even if they were outwardly saying, you know, oh, it's too much. It's like James Albert is crazy. And uh, uh, so I, I wrote a book called Choose Yourself, which is like, don't let other people choose you. Like you guys, if you were pitching this as a TV show, and believe me, I've pitched so many TV shows, you have to go to agents and studios and they treat you like crap and like, uh, and they string you along because they don't know and they have no clue and they're waiting for their bosses to decide. You, you're waiting to be chosen in almost every industry you want to pursue that's, that's worth it. And I'm and I so I wrote a book how really you could find freedom if you just if you want to do a show, just open up your iPhone camera and do a show. Uh, if you want to do a radio show, do a podcast. If you want to write a book, guess what? I there was, I did an experiment. I wrote a novel of, of it was about a 40 page novel under a pseudonym in one weekend and published it by just uploading it to Amazon, making it a paperback and a Kindle and it was available for sale. 
And I started showing people how you could do these things to choose yourself. And then I, re I wrote a book called Choose Yourself about being broke, being just, I lost a home, I lost a marriage, lost everything. And it was really hard. I was like suicidal all the time because you just feel like you can't move. And so I just wrote a book about this and how I kind of climbed out of that hole. And that first, but the first thing that I did was I created a Bitcoin only store to sell a, a, month, a month prior to its release. I released it on Bitcoin only. Like I made it a bookstore for where I only had one product was my book and sold it for Bitcoin only. And that got enough publicity. CNBC had me on to talk about Bitcoin. And they said, did you just do this as a marketing stunt? And I'm like, well, I am on national TV right now. So it worked Thank you very much. See you guys later. And, you know, I made some Bitcoin from that. Bitcoin was around $61. Uh, uh, literally, people were, I was selling that book, a PDF of that book for 0 0.1 Bitcoin. So people were buying uh, now $2,000 of PDF. People were buying that book. But who knew it was going to be big? But the reason I got into Bitcoin was a few months earlier, one of my readers, I would hold these Twitter Q and A's all the time. And one of my readers said, what do you think of Bitcoin? And I said, you know, I don't really know, but it sounds to me like it's a scam or a fad. And Naval Ravikant calls me up and says, listen, I'm flying into New York next week. Why don't we get together for breakfast? I'll explain Bitcoin to you. And we spent like three hours and he went over as much as he possibly could in three hours. And I said, I'm a believer. That's when I made that store, you know, and I, I, start getting excited about Bitcoin. And then it was several years later that, you know, I said, you know, people should need to be right now. Everybody's talking about Bitcoin and using like words like hodl and like their inside lingo. And like, you know, my grandma in Indianapolis or wherever is not going to understand what hodling means. You, if you really want Bitcoin and crypto to do well, you need to explain this to the masses and educate them. And so then I started doing, you know, educational stuff about crypto. And then this newsletter company wanted to partner with me and said, look, you're a good writer, but you don't know how to market. So we'll market you. And they did. I mean, they were spending $60 million a month and my face was everywhere. All like, and with like bitcoins in my eyes, <laughs> like these weird, like, you know, you, you know, Germany Jew kind of, <laughs> kind of images. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I went to on vacation to like, Turks and Caicos during this time. And the taxi driver was like, oh, what crypto should I buy? And it's like everywhere in the world, like I, I and, and then a lot of people really hated it too. Like this guy doesn't represent crypto. And I didn't, I, I wasn't trying to say I, I did, but one time I was, I'd let it get to me, which I, you never should let it, but it's hard. So on Twitter, like one Saturday night, I said, okay, if anyone has a problem with me and crypto, call me right now. This is my phone number. So I started getting call after call and explaining, I'm just trying to educate people. If you're so hot on crypto, you would be happy for what I'm doing. That guy who started Dogecoin called me and he actually then, cause he was trashing me on crypto. And then he, after speaking to me, he tweeted out like, okay, I spoke to him. He's actually, the marketing's a bit aggressive, but <laughs> he actually is a good guy. And, but yeah, it's uh, that was a real painful time. You sound like Nick right now. Like, you know, when people talk to Nick, they're just like, oh no, no, like he's solid. But Nick's like, well, this title is going to get the most views. And before you know it, people are like real mad about a title, you know? Well, yes, that's what happens. Fast forward like eight years later. And I, I wrote an article, no, not eight years, like four years later, or three years later, I wrote an article that had a very aggressive title, but it was about something I passionately cared about. And I wanted people to read it. People don't read unless you... They say don't judge a book by its cover, but you have to. That's the only thing you see before you open the book. And so titles are very important. And Mac, Mike Lazarus said, oh, I know you were just trying to be controversial. And I'm like, no, if you just write to be controversial, you're, you're going to fail. Like, that's a bad writer. Yeah. I could think of plenty of things to be controversial about, and then I'll disappear. Like, the, you just will fail as a writer. You won't have any good stories. You won't be able to really express the vision you have. But I was really concerned about New York City, and I wrote about what I saw the problems were. But I titled the article, oh, New, New York, York City is dead. dead forever. Yeah. Here's why. Jerry Seinfeld responded to that. Oh, my God. So Jerry <laughs> Seinfeld, who's never written an op-ed in his life, does a full-page op-ed in the New York Times just trashing me. <laughs> <laughs> I, he really did. Yeah. And, I'm, and like, so then the New York Post asked me to respond. And I said, you know, you live in Long Island with your 240 Porsches. Like, what, <laughs> what room did you write that art response in? <laughs> like... And, and at the time, I owned a comedy club in New York. I was a stand-up co comedian for about six years, and I, I owned a comedy club. And I said, Jerry, you, I would invite you to, to perform at the comedy club this weekend, but I don't even think you're in the city. So <laughs> he never responded to that. But 
he's a great comedian and I, I loved his book that came out um, right after that. I think he was just kind of promoting his book, but yeah. I have nothing against him. But I was a little disturbed that everybody was like, oh, this guy's not even from New York. Born born in New York. <laughs> Ex-girlfriends were writing articles like, oh, he doesn't even live in New York. I, I, I just re-signed the lease. Like, how are you? What do you know? Like, <laughs> we broke up years ago. And uh, so it was just, but I let it get to me. I did let it get to me. And you, you they always say, don't let it get to you. Um, I remember, like, uh, I was talking to Chuck Palahniuk. I don't know how to say this. I'm the author of Fight Club. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him, you know, this, this really, I let this bother me more than it should. Like, how do you deal with this when you write something? And he was like, you just have to, like, basically say this to everybody. <laughs> and he even checked in a few days later. He's like, hey, just checking in. He's a good guy. But I did let it get to me. And I kind of got burnt out for like a year or so afterwards. I think it was because also I recall reading that article, actually, and being like, Damn, he's given up on the city. Like, I think I had moved to I moved to New York like seven years ago from San Francisco. I was in DC before that, but the uh, I remember being here and being like, "Man, fuck this!" Like, like reading the article and be like, "Nah, it's gonna be all right." I stuck around during, during COVID, but which I wish we just signed a lease like the week before the city <laughs> shut down, which was uh, stupid. I did too. But, by yeah. the way, I had renewed my lease about a week oh, before. There you go. So, yeah. So end of February or whatever it was. Yeah, that, that was a disastrous timing. But it, regardless, yeah, I mean, it struck a chord and you're able, I mean, when you, when you tell narratives, when you tell stories, it does resonate with people and you're, you're very talented at that. So I mean- I, I appreciate you saying yeah. that because I wanted to express to people, I love this city. I mean, yeah. I grew up in and around it all my life. I lived there all my life and I loved it. And I wanted to say this city, I loved, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying transformation is bad, but I just don't want it to die. And people were not, aware. I mean, 60,000 small businesses went out of business during that time. Like it's, it's scary. And then yeah. New York city hasn't recovered no. And look, people who were serious took it seriously. Like Eric Adams, who's now the mayor, good friend of mine was a good friend of mine long before he was mayor. He and I would have nonstop conversations about it. He came on my podcast afterwards to say, no, your article, you know, keep doing this. Gary Vaynerchuk, he helped me put a, a video together kind of explaining a little more right why I wrote that article. But I, I do have to say, and again, it's almost a cliche, like everybody said, don't you can't let everybody get to you. But there was so much hate. There's like 20 million tweets against me. And <laughs> that thing I, went I, super viral. Well, everybody yeah, read the, that article. Twitter, yeah. Twitter is like when you get into a debate with someone, it's it's literally no one wins out of that experience because it's so emotionally draining. Yeah. And 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 then you put up like you get in fight mode at that point, and now you're like going back and forth with like random people. And I'm like, wait, hold like it, yeah, it, it ruins exactly. days of your life, basically, <laughs> where you're just like, this got completely out of control. Initially, I was like enjoying. The, the like attention that was coming in and then it quickly shifts to like i'm not winning any negative like this is just like a ball of neck growing ball of negativity so and, yeah and twitter. it was just non-stop like, yeah and i had even given the advice before like if you start a fight on tw on twitter you've got to reset the clock now like now it's <laughs> you know hour one and you've got to have you now you've got another 24 hours of fighting in front of you you just got to stop reacting but i i couldn't really stop because it was people i knew also yeah. and it was it 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 upset me and it let, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't follow my own advice on that one, but I think it was like the most viral I'd written viral articles and best-selling books before, but like, you know, you had people like, I didn't know Rush Limbaugh and he was reading it word for word on his radio show and Glenn Beck read it word for Joe Rogan was talking about it. And of course, then you go back New York city. People don't like those people. Yeah. <laughs> and so they didn't like people would send me messages. You are who you hang out with. And I'm like, I don't even hang out with my own kids right now. Like I'm in <laughs> hiding and like, you know, but you know, nobody listened. So I left New York. I was like exiled from New York. You, you get put in a box basically yeah. when that happens. And, and it's not because of something that you actually meant to have happen or relationships that you have. Right. It's because you wrote a title. Yeah. It's because I wrote a title <laughs> and nobody would have read it. Otherwise, if I said like, here's six things New York needs to work on, no one would read it. So <laughs> New York city is dead versus here's six things. I can make it a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Then it became a meme. Like, you know, uh, like, oh, are you can next write Bitcoin is dead forever? Like, here's why. Like, every, everybody, like, filled it in with their Those own. do really well. That's, like, a common refrain. NFTs are dead. Yeah, is, Nick's is had us do one. NFTs are dead, like, seven times. We We're an NFT it. YouTube yeah. channel. Works, right? yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, They're it's, dead again. It's, it's so predictable. Did, did you want to? Uh, well, sure. I mean, you know, James, I'm fascinated by the hedge fund component of your career, right? Yeah. And going from essentially programming and content and, you know, going on the streets and, and taking risk 
interviewing pimps and prostitutes. Then you enter hedge fund territory. How about the risk there? Like, you know, oh, yeah. did you have sleepless nights? Like, oh, what's my that God. like? Like, oh my God. First off, I started off as a day trader, which is really horrible. Like, I would, you know, I would put on a trade at 9 30 a.m. and I, I wrote some software to help me trading. And I, 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 I would, the software would give me a signal. Oh, the past 99 times out of 100 that this series of events happened, you can make a trade at 9 30, be out by 10. And so a lot of days it would work out. I'm like, oh, this is the greatest ever. Made some money in the first half hour. And then the, every now and then, though, you're in this trade and it's like not working out. And it's like, oh, it went down a little, went down a little. There was a church across the street from my house. I would go over there and pray. <laughs> even though I'm Jewish, but so is Jesus. <laughs> I figured we were cool with that. And um, but then I started um, a hedge fund where I then uh, it raised money and invested in other hedge funds. So it got me really kind of unusually informed about finance because I was interviewing maybe like a thousand different hedge funds to invest in. And I had raised money from people who I had previously helped make money for and uh, invested in about a dozen hedge funds. And we were doing really well, but it was really it was a real it was hard for me to raise money. Like I didn't have I didn't have an MBA. I didn't work at had, you know, I didn't have the Goldman Sachs pedigree and then worked at like a super big hedge fund. I was just me and wasn't really, I raised a good enough money to make a living, but not like huge amount of money. And I remember one time my neighbor says to me, oh, you should meet my boss. He runs a, a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. He'll like you. you. You guys will get along. He'll invest in your fund. So I go into the city with my friend and the boss meets me gives me the full tour of the facility. We sit down in his office and he's like, James, I really like you. What, what, you know, what do you want from us? And I said, I'd really like you to put money in my fund. And he's like, well, we already have a fund. And I'm like, yeah, but you need to diversify a little bit. I have a different strategy than you. You could diversify. And he says, listen, you could have a job here anytime you want. I'll hire you in a second. But uh, I don't know where you're putting the money. And he pointed to himself. The last thing I need to see is Bernard Madoff Securities LLC in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So literally Bernie Madoff rejected me and I'm leaving his building and I'm thinking, man, I can't compete with guys like Bernie Madoff. Like they're the best. <laughs> and like all these other hedge funds were calling me as I was leaving. Like, can we, how does how does he do it? He's amazing. How does Bernie Madoff do it? They've all denied making those calls to me. But I know why would I I have the phone records and you know, and then I, I actually that began starting the process of unraveling that hedge fund because I just didn't know how to raise money. Here's a guy with supposedly a sixty billion dollar hedge fund. He wouldn't put money with me. People should invest with him. I don't know. And I think that's the problem with scams on Wall Street is that they crowd out all the legit stuff because Bernie Madoff was making a percent a month. Everybody liked that. That's an impossible goal to achieve in general. But he had been doing it for twenty years, and so everyone you know, that crowds out. We were legit and it just crowds out. We couldn't compete with that because so many people were fooled. And so then after he he blew up, I remember my friend who was my neighbor, he called me up and he was like crying. Like Bernie was like a father figure to me. And all these people who, you know, they missed out on their bonuses. They, they, it was like a murderous like feeling they all had. And then I wrote about it for the financial times. And one woman called me, she was from Minnesota. And she's like, why do people think, all the investors in Madoff were Jews. Like I'm Catholic and I invested in Madoff. I lost money too. So he really heard a lot of, like there was at least a dozen suicides among the investors of, of Madoff. Like it was Which is insane. I also read that like supposedly like 95% of the money was returned to investors fully yeah. or something like that. It was well, the, 95% of the original money invested. So yeah. not, not the not returns, the but yeah. like people didn't really lose their initial money in the long run. We didn't, yeah. nobody knew that in the beginning, but, but still they, you still you think to yourself, oh, I just got a my statement from Madoff. My initial hundred thousand is worth twelve million. So you start spending based on that, and people really lost, you know, lost everything. So, so we're at a Web three conference, and I'm wondering if Bernie Madoff was around now, would he be investing in NFTs or running an NFT fund? You know, I don't think so. Only because he was. Here's what I really think happened with Bernie Madoff. I think he he was, you know, the chairman of the Nasdaq. He kind of invented digital or electronic trading of stocks. And everyone's like, oh, Bernie, you're the smartest in the world. You're the smartest person in the world. You should do a hedge fund. So I think then he started managing people's money. And I think he wasn't very good at it. Like it takes a different set of skills, but he was so ashamed. Like everyone told him he was the biggest genius. He was so ashamed 
that he just started lying right from the beginning. He's like, oh, yeah, you're doing great. And he'd have to raise more money and became a Ponzi scheme. And this doesn't forgive anything. I'm, it's just trying to figure out the psychology of someone like that. By the way, fast forwarding then a decade later, I, he's in prison and I um, you know, had a, 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 a podcast, a growing podcast. And so I reached out to him in jail and I said, would you come on my podcast? And of course, the message has to go through the warden. And the warden finally gets back to me and says, Bernie says, no, no, re no reason given. I'm like, that guy just rejected me again. Like, <laughs> how does it keep happening? You know, that, like one thing he gained in life is like, while he's making license plates, he gets to reject me. Consistently. Uh, well, I'm actually curious on your take. So outside of Bernie Madoff, what, what is your take on sort of the NFT space as a whole? Do you have any interest in it whatsoever? And what, yeah. what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it really reminds me of like when the internet first started. Nobody really knew, oh, this is going to be an e-commerce, this, this worldwide e-commerce platform where all e-commerce transactions, all retail transactions basically are going to start happening through, through this thing called the internet. Like, is this an artistic medium? Is it... Oh, hypertext. Is it a new way to write books? Is it uh, uh, just a pamphlet? Like, let's put all, every company will put their pamphlet online. Like, nobody really knew. And it just sort of evolved with time. Like, there's this technology here that seems neat and it evolved over time. NFTs, like, oh, a digital ape, will that be interesting? Maybe, but probably not. I think NFTs are exciting to me if you think of them as access to something so you get let's say you're a sports team you're, let's say you're the new york knicks basketball team and you sell a ticket uh and and you sell the ticket to me and then i sell the ticket to you for like you sell a ticket to me for a hundred dollars i sell the ticket to you for 200 you sell it to you you're a scalper for 300 you sell it to someone on the street for 400 the knicks only makes money on that first transaction to me but if a ticket was an nft they would make money every step of the way mm -hmm. you know and i think nfts are great as access like oh you have a restaurant hey you get the special menu if you have our limited drop nft oh you, and i've talked to the owners of sports teams i spoke to mark laurie uh owns the minnesota timberwolves among other things he sold jet.com to, to walmart and i told him what do you think of this idea for nfts and they're like we're already building it and like every sports owner i've spoken to is in the process of that's how they're thinking of nfts it's like this is a a, a doorway to access to something special and I think it will continue that way. And and it'll revolutionize, I think, season tickets. And I think you yeah. can add some of the rarity mechanics. Like, for example, right now with NFTs, if you buy an NFT collection, when it reveals, that's when you find out if you got a rare one. When you apply that to ticketing, when it reveals, maybe it's courtside, maybe it's nosebleeds, yeah. you know? Oh, it's, it, yeah, right. And it's, so it's great for, for marketing. It's like buying a cereal box, but I get the prize you yep. know, at the bottom. And, and, you know, even for subscription businesses, like if I subscribe to let's say an expensive newsletter about NFTs. And I wanna, maybe it's nice if I can, when I'm done being interested in NFTs, maybe I can sell that subscription. And the original newsletter company gets benefit from that. And so I think it's gonna revolutionize, revolutionize the economy of anything that could be subscription. It'll unlock a lot of value for companies. But I think that's true in the case for crypto in general. Like there's lots of ways See, people always say, well, what are the real world use cases? Like, what can I do with crypto that I can't do with anything else? And, or with just, I can't just do with regular software on the internet. And there's a lot of things. Like, basically, with crypto, you could take anything at all that has value and tokenize it, make a crypto out of it or an NFT out of it, and trade it for something else that has value completely different. Like, I could take, I could say, hey, you guys are going to make an income stream from all your podcasts and YouTube streams. I want, you should, you should tokenize. 10% of your cash flows for the next 10 years on, of all your media stuff. And it's all going to get funneled into your media company and you'll tokenize 10% of the cash flows. Whoever buys like, you know, your coin, whatever it's called, uh, will, will participate in your growth and your cash flows. And, and then it has monetary value. So it could be bought and sold on DeFi exchanges and it could even be sold. You could use it to buy shares of McDonald's or to buy a piece of real estate or to buy bonds or to buy uber coin once uber starts doing something like this and this internet of value where everything of value can talk to everything else of value that has never existed before i mean if you want to trade financial assets right now and you're a regular person on the street you got to wait till monday morning at 9 30 mm -hmm. call up your broker or go online new york stock exchange is open from 9 30 to 4 30 you could only buy stocks you can't buy anything else and you could trade dollars for stocks and that's it but with crypto it's 24 7 and everything of value 
like an Uber ride has value, an Airbnb stay has value, a newsletter or a newspaper, your, your media content has value. A, a, a young student with a law degree, their future cash flows have value. Everything of value is going to be tradable for everything else of value. And that's like such a quadrillion dollar opportunity. And that the value in crypto now is the ecosystem that's building that because it's not quite there yet. And the user base is not quite there yet. But that's an unbelievable use case. It's a quadrillion dollar use case, which is why when someone asks me, what's the use cases or it's bullshit, like this, this use case, you could, it's the first time ever you could borrow from future profits to, to monetize your business now and create something of value and, and trade it for anything else of value 24 seven, never happened before in history. And it's such an amazing thing for the economy. Once it starts to be real in crypto, crypto happens to be the only way to do it. You can't do it any other way. And it's because of the technology. Do you have a question, Nick? Yeah. Well, the last thing on that is, are you making any investments in the NFT space or is there anyone that, uh, you like for, for me when when I was getting into NFTs, in addition to starting in it, I started reaching out to all the people back from when I was in the Facebook sp space, basically. And uh, and I was like, hey, are you like looking at NFTs? And I saw more and more people from that era kind of like hopping into to this space. And I'm like, OK, well, if Johnny and Mary are both in here, well, we're, we're like we're, we're good. And uh, yeah, I'm, we're going to I'm just going to keep building. Um, are you seeing. A, are you seeing that sort of like social proof within your own network? And then also, are you simultaneously like making any investments in it? I, you know, it's hard to say because again, we just don't know where, and I think NFTs do end up like how we described before. And I just don't see the value in buying like a JPEG or something like that right now, or an NFT in a metaverse game. Like, uh, you know, again, some people maybe are finding value and I could easily be wrong about it, but I do see the few, so what I'm interested in or like, let's say the tokens that are picks and shovels in the space. Like, how do you make it so that, you know, grandma from Indiana, Indiana could, could trade, you know, tokens from one complicated wallet to another complicated wallet? Or how can you get, you know, information that's in this blockchain to share with information on this blockchain? I think the infrastructure still has another ending or two to go. And then we're going to start seeing widespread uses and, and widespread users. And so, so specifically NFTs, I'd like to see Again, will it be used for ticketing? Will it be used for subscriptions? Will it be used for access to venues or events or whatever? I think that's coming. I have no doubt that that's coming. And I see a lot of businesses working on this, but I haven't made any investments in the space. Um, so you talked about uh, Naval Ravikant, you know, explaining Bitcoin to you when in 2010? Uh, no, this was 20, early 2013. Early so March 2013. 2013, I had tweeted it was a scam. <laughs> uh, I think in April 2013, he visited me. And he totally changed my mind on it. I had him speak on, I hosted a summit where he was the key person there in San Francisco. And he, that was 2013. I bought Bitcoin at like a hundred dollars then. Yeah. And he was, I was under the impression that he had a shit ton of Bitcoin at that point. But everything he says, it, he's like one of the perfect, like sort of, um, if you see entrepreneurs in, in Silicon Valley, when they're giving answers to questions, a lot of the question or responses can be sort of like, obtuse or abstract when they're giving the responses about it about how we're developing and specific products and stuff like they're not giving you like your practical man on the street like sort of response they're giving you like this big visionary thing and some of the stuff that he would he, uh he was very succinct in his description of kind of the implications of blockchain but simultaneously he he always had there there's curiosity that that he leaves you sort of wondering like, oh, well, I wonder what he's doing with like that thing over there. Like, what's it? What's your real motive with AngelList? Like, I, I don't I don't quite understand. Like, well, so, AngelList is going to be very successful with like that's yeah. going to be like the Goldman Sachs of like startup companies. Yeah. And it already is. I mean, that's already yes. worth billions. And he's invested. He's such a great angel investor. Yeah. I don't know how how invested he is in Bitcoin, but you're right. He, he basically says, look, he gave presented the, the picture to me and like yeah. I said to him, well, how much would one invest in Bitcoin? And he said, well, if you believe it has a 1% chance of being the world's currency, put 1% of your portfolio in it because it'll be huge. Yeah. And, but you know, the, the real thing is, is that you never know with what the ultimate use cases are. Like, no, you don't really know what value a business has until someone tells you not why they're using it, but why they aren't using it. Like you ever pitch investors and they say, man, that sounds great. That sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah. Just pitch us when, when it's all done, when you're done with the product and then they never return your calls again. So, but you say, but they said, yes, they like the idea. 
No, there's a lot of reasons people say yes. They said yes to get you off the phone. Yeah. Yeah. That was the reason they said yes at that time. But if someone doesn't use something and you ask them, why aren't you using Bitcoin now? Well, you know, there's all these wallets. And what if I forget my password? Like now they're telling you real problems to solve. Yes. And, and that's like a great, you know, cue about what businesses to start and so on. So I feel like we're still in that phase where no one really knows. Like I gave this idea a few minutes ago about oh here's quadrillion dollar use cases and and maybe that will work but still every step of the way why aren't people doing it yet well there's not enough users well it's too hard like i explain bitcoin to people older than me and they're like oh well i gotta use this wallet for this and how come i I could buy this token in new york but not in south carolina and like it's it's really complicated and that needs to just like with the internet for 30 years, you know, the internet started in the early 1970 or 1971 for a long time. Nobody could use the internet. Then it got easier and easier and easier. And now we all use it. Crypto is moving a lot faster. So that we have to be thankful for. And all the use cases are already starting to happen, but it's still got a few innings to go. And so my follow up on that is you had Bitcoin for 10 years now, almost, or at least been thinking yeah. about it. What's changed since 2013? Do you think of it the same way you always did? Like, what do you think of Bitcoin now that there's like, quote unquote, competition of like Ethereum and things like that? Or do you not even look at it as competition? What's like the 2022 uh, impression of Bitcoin in your mind? Uh, Bitcoin's probably a scam and a fad. No, no. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, I actually did decide to sell the Bitcoin. I had, you know, I had been investing in Bitcoin for a while and I decided to sell it and move it all into Ethereum. And maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. You know, one way or the other. I think, I think Bitcoin continues to stay here and continues to, you know, will go up in the next cycle. And but I just think Ethereum will go up more. And already there's more transactions per day on Ethereum. And you know, this merge happened. Now the the surge, the purge, all these things are going to happen. So they're really developing the ecosystem of Ethereum. Bitcoin is a good example of like, okay, here's crypto. It works. But I don't see the infrastructure around Bitcoin really being built where there's a lot of projects around the infrastructure of Ethereum. It's really made to create use cases. Bitcoin's got the Lightning Network to make transactions faster and to do some types of smart contracts. But I think Ethereum just is the real Bitcoin ultimately. And I ultimately don't know the use case of Bitcoin because we see right now the US dollar was weak because of inflation. But every other currency in the world was so much weaker that the dollar is strong is the strongest of all of them now and so people just love the dollar that won't always be the case but will bitcoin be the replacement we can't predict and if bitcoin's not putting together the the financial ecosystem which i think is going to be the big use case ethereum is maybe the winner or maybe solana maybe cardano but again ethereum is is the top gun right now in terms of transactions per day and and you and projects using it and use cases so so i actually like Ethereum better. I'm bullish on Bitcoin, but I thought Ethereum as a blue chip crypto was a bit safer for me than Bitcoin. All righty. Nick's smiling and laughing. I'm a big Bitcoiner. You know, obviously <laughs> we have an NFT business, so I'm I'm aware of Ethereum and stuff. I was hoping that you didn't answer like that. But <laughs> no, but, you know, it's a good answer. Look, you know, like a lot of guys are Bitcoin maximalists, like Anthony Pompliano, who's like one of the smartest names in the space. He's a Bitcoin maximalist. You know, I've had Kevin O'Leary on my podcast. I think he's more neutral, but I think he has veered into that camp in and out of the big maximalist camp i think now that the merge has happened with ethereum he's 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 open to it but you know i think people are still figuring it out and by the way i don't think bitcoin's going anywhere i think it's always the first it's always the winner maybe it's a store of value um you know it, but again I'm, I'm struggling with the use cases on bitcoin other than as a currency and i don't know how it gets there as a currency when the dollar is so strong maybe the dollar doesn't remain so strong but it's confounding people right now. Not going to disagree. He's totally right. Yeah. Anything the PSS yeah. from here on out, completely wrong. I think that if you asked Pomp, my like, if you put a gun to my head, what would Pomp say if you said, what's the uh, the use case for Bitcoin? He would probably say its use case is to be an institution-grade safe haven asset. So if a pension fund needs to park money for 100 years, Bitcoin's probably yes. the best place to do it. That's correct. Like So for instance, but he would also say, by the way, you don't need Ethereum because the Bitcoin Lightning Network, they will eventually use that Lightning And the network. layers after the yeah. Lightning Network, so, right. So he's a big believer in, in Bitcoin um, uh, replacing Ethereum. So it's just that hasn't happened. So you, you just have to ask why it's going the other direction. But 
you know, you talk to a Kevin O'Leary who spends time with like the sovereign wealth fund of Dubai and Saudi Arabia. And he loves those guys. Like, yeah. Yeah. He knows them. He knows what they're looking for. They're looking to put some of their assets in Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is the, the blue chip. So I think you're right. As an investable asset, Bitcoin is the one the world considers as investable. And Ethereum is sort of like, OK, but we need some software now to make everything. Let's use we got to buy Ethereum to do that. So they're still going to stay neck and neck. I just think Ethereum is going to edge it out a little bit. But, you know, there was no, you know, I don't know which one will go up more, but, you know, I decided to place my bet on Ethereum instead of Bitcoin. But look, all the sovereign wealth funds, though, are going to buy Bitcoin. That's the first thing they're going to do. Once the laws look, even the laws have not evolved. Yeah. They don't I'm not touching. They're, they're saying now I'm not touching Bitcoin because they there's no know your customer. There's no anti money laundering. You know, we need to figure out the anti money laundering so we know the loopholes because we're planning on laundering. Money <laughs> so, so they need they need those laws in place yeah, to give structure for uh, running running uh, fraud. Uh, in terms of, the, did you have any other? Uh, no, I mean, I look, like towards the yeah, we, we've taken fifty minutes of your time. We really and, appreciate it, James. Go ahead. Yeah, if there's any any other, if there was a uh, sort of broad sweeping uh take on nfts that you have today other than what you've said so far is there anything else that you like to say about it so our our content is very heavily nft centric yeah it's also just because last year and through now we we heavily lean towards the speculation side just because that's where a lot of the activity has been in the space is people saying wait i can buy this and make like i put in two thousand dollars i make two million dollars like that's that's very right. compelling to me so uh, so but, so I think that it, it I think that's how NFT got a lot of interest because the yeah. money there. But like think about it. Like there's all these games, like, oh, we made this game and you could buy property uh next to Snoop Dogg in our in our metaverse with an NFT. But so far I haven't seen anybody say, Oh, that game is fun. Yeah. So I need Big the problem. To, yeah, I need the games to be fun first, which is why I think Microsoft was oddly and smart about this. They bought Take Two Interactive and they're probably gonna release all the properties of all their games as NFTs. Like I do think, you know, there's two ways to kind of move value into the crypto universe. One is by tokenizing it, like we discussed earlier. The other is with, you know, NFTs, because it's like property can't be divided up in the game. So we're gonna sell this one property as an NFT, or we're gonna sell like, you know, this subscription to the Wall Street Journal as an NFT. So I think NFTs have a broad use case. And I even think in the metaverse, when the games, when it flips, when the real games yeah. say, hey, we're open to this NFT thing, I think then it's going to be really huge. I'm actually wondering, this would be one last follow on question. I, I'm of the mindset or the biggest question mark on all of this for me is will corporations adopt Ethereum and uh, actual crypto blockchains or are they going to try and implement their own? Facebook tried to, they then shut it down with Circle or whatever uh, their thing was. But I'm wondering what your take is if if you think you know, Apple is going to try and cannibalize that, that entire system and say, we just view these as digital goods. You can own it within our ecosystem. We've partnered up together and this is the blockchain that we're using. Because like you said, the biggest issue is, uh, you know, consumer adoption and consumer uses and and picks and shovel side of things, which is saying, hey, how do we onboard people yeah. into it? Do, where, where, if you were going to place your bet, would you say that the Facebooks, uh, the Microsoft, the, like the gaming the ecosystem are going to adopt pre-existing blockchains or do you think that they're going to actually go uh, use their own I, I think they're going to do both and you look you look at like ibm for instance they have made a set of tools for companies to make their own private blockchains and sometimes in the enterprise you're going to want your own private blockchain because you control the data you control access to it uh but ultimately it's just like the internet you know when the internet started a companies have their own private networks that didn't communicate outward to any other networks and then there were companies like AOL, which wasn't hooked up to the internet at all, Prodigy, CompuServe, none of these were hooked up to the internet. And the internet was just sitting there. And then eventually AOL let their users go on the internet, CompuServe, Prodigy, companies realized, oh, we have to figure out a gateway to go from our network to the internet so we can communicate with other private networks. The same thing's gonna happen here. Like there will be lots of blockchains, but like we were talking about earlier, there's already tokens being made to take information from one blockchain to other blockchains. So that's part of the picks and shovels that are being built. And ultimately, I think there will be one kind of, you know, crypto superhighway, like the information superhighway. There'll be some one sort of crypto superhighway that will kind of join them all. But also it's valid that companies will want their own private chains as well. Mm -hmm. And and for various reasons. But I do think what we we're going to see happening is that 
again, every company, like like take Uber as an example. Uber, I, I keep mentioning Uber, but Uber, they can't make any money to save their lives. Like VC subsidized every single ride you took for 10 years on Uber. And in order for Uber, and then they VC said, enough of this, we need our money. Let's just sell it to the idiots. So they took the company public, that the public they view as idiots. So which is the problem with both Wall Street and VCs. And and you know, the public bought it and the stock's gone down ever since. They can't they either have to you know, pay their rider, their drivers less, which they're not going to do, or they have to make the rise more expensive, which they can't do. But maybe they can make Uber coin. So if you ride more, you get tokens deposited in your account that you can be, that can be used to pay for future rides or drivers get good reviews. They get tokens that can be used to pay for mm -hmm. future rides, almost like frequent flyer miles with one big difference. Now it's tradable for anything else of value, Airbnb coin, McDonald's coin, Yeah, you know, 5% of someone's house that's tokenized, uh, you know, your future cash flows. So like all these things that we can't even imagine now as use cases will become valid, quad, a quadrillion dollar crypto eco financial ecosystem. Ultimately, I'm looking forward to that and becoming quadrillionaires in the process. Pretty so, good. Uh, there will be. I mean, look, it's <laughs> almost a tr like Elon's almost yeah, a trillionaire. It's ridiculous. So. <laughs> it's absolutely absurd. Well, I know for, uh, I, both of us uh, appreciate you taking the time today to come chat with us. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's really yeah. exciting. I'm really happy. Thanks so much, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, James Altucher. Uh, check him out, jamesaltucher.com, I'm assuming, yeah? Yeah, or know the James Altucher Show podcast or whatever. You've heard of him, not us. Uh, smash the subscribe <laughs> down below. Cl uh, click the like. Thanks so much. See you next time.